Well, my name is Stephen McCulloch, and I just want to thank you for the show here today. And uh, so I work as a consultant right now for boys and young men in the adult infant industry at the academy. And uh, so I've been doing that for about 10 years now, and we work for nonprofits setting up projects for boys in the academy, for the DCF contract. So um, in my 10 years of training, I'm still amazed that when I go into a training, I ask people to raise their hand how many people have worked with boys that have been sexually victimized in some way, and not one hand goes up. So uh, when it comes to human trafficking, it's just uh, very gender specific about girls, not about boys at all. So uh, this is my mission, not only to work with male population, but bring people together in the form of other kinds of ways to bring awareness uh, to males uh, not only in craft history, but also to bring together the various forms of sexual victimization over my lifespan. So I reached out to my buddies over here who worked with me today, and we're going to talk about each of them on the sexual victimization. So I'm just really glad that you are that you have opened the information. Thank you. Great. So I'm going to uh, introduce the, the panel here, and I'll, I'll give the introduction in the order that they'll be speaking, they'll be sharing. Um, and then each speaker will come up for 20 minutes and share uh, from their perspective. And then at the end, we'll have some time for questions and discussion. So first we'll have Steve and Procopio come back up and share. And, um, and he, Steven is a trainer and consultant in working with males in trauma history. His ex expertise is in the area of childhood sexual abuse, commercial sexual exploitation, and other forms of sexual victimization. Stephen brings extensive experience in public health, homelessness, and youth services. His experience involved implementing innovative initiatives supported by demonstration projects on HIV from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health in community-based AIDS service organizations. Stephen worked with executive directors of AIDS service organizations on the design, implementation, and evaluation of a case management system for DPH-funded programs in Massachusetts, developing coordinated services based on a continuum of care. Stephen's work in youth services include work as an adolescent therapist, director of a youth shelter for runaway homeless youth, and a family reunification facilitator. Stephen's present professional work is with boys and men with trauma history, with a focus on childhood sexual abuse, commercial sexual exploitation, and other forms of sexual victimization. He is a trainer consultant with the National Human Trafficking Training and Consulting Center. Stephen founded the first in the nation freestanding program serving commercially sexually exploited boys and adolescent males. Stephen has taught and presented on the issues of male victimization on a local and national level consulting with various groups on the effects of male childhood sexual abuse and commercial sector exploitation. Stephen served on the Victim Services Subcommittee on the Massachusetts Attorney General's Task Force on Human Trafficking. Stephen presently serves as Clinical Director of Male Survivor, an organization addressing the needs of men victimized by sexual abuse and assault, a graduate of the University of Connecticut School of Social. So then we'll have <laughs> so then we'll have Matthew Swollen. Did I say that right? He, Matthew is, an, is the executive director and director of youth and prevention programs at the, at the Second Step, where he is leading innovative new programming to reach youth survivors of domestic abuse, build their resiliency, and create bright futures. He comes to this work after having served as a crisis counselor for the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center, where he was among the first men to take calls on the 24-hour hotline. Prior to the second step, Matthew worked with high-risk and formerly incarcerated youth at Roca Incorporated and oversaw the youth work team during the rollout of the Massachusetts Pay for Success Social Innovation Financing Project. He is an author and scholar, and his blog posts have been featured on Teaching Tolerance, the project of the Southern Poverty Law Center. And then we will have Sharon in Karachi. So Sharon is a licensed mental health counselor and trained rape crisis counselor in Massachusetts, 
where she has been working in the field of sexual trauma for over 15 years. Sharon is a proud member of the Male Survivor Weekend of Recovery Clinical Team. She has extensive experience in counseling individual group, couples, and family. Sharon is also an experienced trainer and has facilitated trainings ranging from how to appropriately respond to disclosures of sexual violence to advanced clinical skills trainings for providers working with sexual trauma survivors. And has provided trainings all over the country on how to provide services to male survivors of sexual trauma for students, military personnel, clinicians, and other professionals. She has also provided trainings to university counseling centers and has been a guest lecturer for undergraduate and graduate classes at Tufts University, Northeastern University, and Boston University. Sharon was an adjunct faculty member in graduate programs at Boston University and Lesley University, as well as a contracted trauma specialist at another Boston area university. Sharon maintained a private practice in Cambridge, Massachusetts for seven years where she provided services to clinic to clients as well as clinical supervision and consultation to other professionals on the issues of sexual trauma. And then to wrap it up, we'll have Michelle Ralph. Since 1983, Michelle has you say that right? Yeah, so yeah. Great. <laughs> Just check. So, Mattel has worked with men and women specializing in the areas of sexual, religious, ritual, and physical trauma, doing relational psychotherapy, utilizing EMDR, art, music, body, authentic movement, humor, and mindful presence. She was a facilitator of MaleSurvivor.org, Weekends of Recovery Team, since its inception, and in partnership with Male Survivor until 2016. Now she is the founding chair of Taking Back Ourselves Weekends of Recovery, committed to women's survivors of sexual abuse, violence, and insults. Mikkel has written for Candid, C-A-N-D-I-D, The Missouri Review, The National Catholic Report, Cross Currents Magazine, Healing Ministry, and The New Therapist, and New Paradigm Magazine on working with male survivors. She is the author of Healing the Soul After Religious Abuse, the dark haven of recovery. She practices in Brookline, Massachusetts. So I'd like to welcome up Stephen Prokofio. Stephen Prokofio, yeah. First time. First time is up. Yeah, nice to be So this, this component, we're going to talk about trafficking of um, males. And so, um, just to get through that, I think we need to put some context into the federal law. There's federal laws, or anti-trafficking laws, and then there's all, I think the last count, 37 states that have state laws are combating human trafficking, which is called safe harbor laws. So uh, Massachusetts is one of them that does have the safe harbor law. But I want, just for purpose of my conversation, just to get into the definition of the federal law for trafficking. So sex trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, and transportation, provision, obtaining, patronizing, or soliciting of a person for the purposes of a commercial sex act in which the commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person induced to perform such an act has not attained the age of 18 years of age. So with all that legalese, it basically states now that any person under the age of 18 to no longer, ideally, no longer be arrested for prostitution. That it's a victim against, uh, it's a crime against the child. And hopefully what we do with that is get kids into services. So um, I think the issue uh, with boys, but the challenge has been, is that I think to get a little bit socially political, we pretty much live in a culture where males are considered to be perpetrators and women are always, you know, girls are always considered to be feminists. And we don't sort of realize that uh, men are perps and they're victims and women are perps and they're victims of various kinds. So I think there's been a lot of sexism. There's also been a lot of homophobia and gender bias when it comes to services towards males. And uh, given our culture and the comings and goings in the human service field, I find my tenures that I no sooner 
train a group of people and they're all gone because they moved on. And then there's a new group that comes in with those same kind of biases. So it's always something that we're having to deal with around male victimization, different white policy that we'll get into as well. The important thing is I don't consider trafficking to be a linear phenomenon at all. It's not about trafficker and, and victim. It's not about male, trafficker male, and, and female victim. The law protects people under the age of 18 if you're being actively hit, if you're doing sex work, or you're doing survival sims. Not all girls get hint. Not all boys don't get hint. So boys get hint and not hint, and girls get hint and not hint. So the law is much more expansive in terms of providing services and not arresting those people under the age of 18. So I don't see it as really linear, and I think that's a lot of our traditional services around trafficking that fit into the mold of trafficker, pin, and female victim. So I think we really need time to get out of that. I think there's a lot of judgment against boys that are work as sex workers, a lot of bias and uh, survival sex. And what we're going to talk a little bit about is those circumstances by which bring them into that situation. So when we look at CSEC, uh, to expand on this definition, it's anything that involves street prostitution, uh, street prostitution <laughs> pornography, stripping, erotic new massage, escort services, phone sex lines for both old enough like me to remember phone sex, uh, private parties, gang-based prostitution. And it's interesting because some of the FBI people that I've talked to more recently, we thought of uh, the organized crime in the old days that got out of the Godfather where it would be prostitution and drugs. Now uh, the FBI is telling me that uh, organized crime is more like a white collar crime. And what we know about uh, prostitution for both female and male victims, that is a lot uh, mostly gang-based. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, interest in no repenting and internet-based. Um, so what I hear from a lot of providers is that uh, when they're dealing with trafficking victims, boys or men are not disclosed, so it must not be happening to them. Or when we do assessment forms, we're not getting kids to disclose that they are exchanging sex for money, food, or whatnot. And what I say is that we're in a culture where boys are not going to disclose their victimization, whether it's their sexual abuse or other kinds of sexual victimization. And um, so my sort of issue with assessment forms is that they're only as good as the kid who's going to tell the truth about what his experience is. So in some of the past organizations I worked with, when we knew we were dealing with boys that were being sexually exploited, but well, when we would look at their uh, the intake forms, and we would ask those key questions, they would always say no, but we knew in fact that they were being exploited. So I'm not a big proponent of assessment forms at this point, so I, what I really take a look at, if you want to discover if the males that you're working with are victimized, is to look at their adverse childhood experiences right. and then their behavioral indicators. So what we know about adverse childhood experiences, are, so I'll give you some examples of adverse childhood experiences when you're doing the assessment on boys. So we're looking at kids with a physical abuse history, neglect, childhood sexual abuse, uh, a lot of street violence, gang activity, family abduction, custodial interference, uh, rape and assault. And uh, so what the AC, ACE people say, if your kids have four or more of those experiences, they have now what we call complex trauma. So most of the boys that I've worked with historically they had like six to 10 of those experiences, which placed them into that category of complex trauma and all the psychological and social issues that they face as a result. So those are key factors that you need to look at when you're trying to discover if a kid is being uh, exploited or at high risk for it. So when you, after you uh, get those categories, the next thing that you need to take a look at are behavioral indicators because it's always certain kinds of behaviors that kids will engage in based on their trauma. And what's uh, some of the high risk factors are, are kids that have history of depression and suicide, oppositional behavior disorder, which is big for boys, kids in multiple foster placements. Foster placements are not a big fan of foster care in our country, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and runaway homelessness. So we know for a kid who's on the street, 
Uh, within the first 48 hours of being on the street, that's about 50% of the time they're uh, contacted or connected with a pimp or some kind of traffic or based on that. And what we know is that more than 50% of our street and homeless folk are men. They have much less resources for housing and uh, shelter care. So when you take a look at the, all those components, those are, really need to be your indicators or ways to engage with the youth or work with them to sort of do an assessment around their potential sexual victimization. So I did a series of focus groups in Boston a few years ago because there really was no researcher data up to that about four years ago on employees uh, that were commercially sexually exploited. So I did different components of trying to get definition of how boys are living the life or what kinds of experiences they have in various categories of their definition. So we came up with, uh, there was just four different categories for boys on the streets in Massachusetts. And uh, the first one is that boys are escorts, they're street workers, uh, internet dating, and the clubs. So es escorts are uh, boys generally between 16 and 24 years of age, where they have a set. Can you just talk a little bit louder? Like the floor? No, I, don't, I can't. I like to talk louder. Some people call, but I'm thinking, oh, we can't hear. Well, okay. You can't hear. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Okay. Do you have to get the key again? Can you hear me now? <laughs> Is it better? Okay. Thank you so much. That's why I'm so We're looking at the different categories by which boys are being sexually exploited. And the first category is escort. And it's usually boys between the age of 16 and 24. And they have a set clientele that they work for. And they're on, on call, essentially, for their clientele. And they, they, it's upwards of uh, 10 people that they might be connected to as an escort. So what will happen is the buyer, I call them buyers. So what the buyer will do is make contact with the youth uh, and to set up a time uh, where they're gonna meet. And usually it's in a hotel because hotels are notorious for harboring trafficking activity that goes on. So what will happen, so the paper chase doesn't go to the buyer, the kid gets the hotel room and his, with his credit card and uh, so he goes to register when he goes to the hotel to get the room uh you know usually when i travel a lot i i travel alone but i'm always given two key cards by the front desk and i'm wondering why you know there's only me why are you giving me two key cards and so what happens is the kid will get the key card go into his room he'll take the second key card and meet the man outside give him that key card and go back in by himself and then the, the buyer will go in so a lot of times now you can't get up in hotel rooms without the card in the, in the uh, elevator. So they'll do their interchange and that pretty much will be it. The second are street workers. Uh, and that's not so much prevalent in New England anymore. In certain parts of the country, like the Deep South or the border states between the U.S. and Mexico, kids are traditionally on the street where there's different pickup sites where the buyer will come in and uh, make arrangements for this anonymous sex uh, connection. Thank you. And uh, so that's not so much prevalent in our area anymore because the next one, which is prevalent here, is internet dating. There's various hookup sites like Grindr or Tinder, um, Grind or Tinder. <laughs> Big fish. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was what I was looking for. So what will happen is that there will be a, a the buyer and the youth will be uh, on this hookup site through, um, you know, social media or whatnot, and they'll make arrangements to hook up and meet somewhere. And so that's uh, much more difficult to monitor for kids. And then the last one are the clubs. So for women, you may have heard of, you know, strip clubs where men participate in watching women do pole dancing or whatnot, where there's prostitution there. And for boys, it's the gay clubs. So those are the four different uh, categories that uh, boys are living in the life. So another concern that I had is, uh, do boys get pimped or do boys not get pimped? 
So um, a lot of the focus groups I also did was to get, gather information that boys are getting pimp and who these pimps are. So uh, one of the major ways of entry into commercial sexual exploitation is by the family. So oftentimes, and I've heard of boys as young as six years old getting pimped out by their families for drug and alcohol money. Um, there's also uh, pimps who uh, nowadays are getting much more uh, astute around having various clients, as they call them, uh, where they can make mar maximize market demand. So there are pimps now that have boys, girls, kids with disabilities, trans youth, and whatnot. So as the requests come in for youth, this pimp will have those. Uh, there's another form, what we call community pimps, and for oftentimes street kids or kids who are, are runaways will meet other kids who are doing survival sex, and uh, so they form like little families with one another and uh, support one another around survival sex. Another form is aged out pimp, which is getting prevalent for both girls and boys. Uh, where so kids who have been commercially sexually exploited who age out of that our community oftentimes will um, set up their own form, their own businesses. So former exploited youth now become the pimp. And then the next one I sort of labeled the fee for service pimp. Uh, the um, for those of you that are familiar with the Boston Common at the Boston Street Tea Stop, which is across the street from the Lowe's Megaplex. There's a lot of activity that goes on that small corner, right at that tea stop of various kinds. And one thing that will happen is these guys will drive up and pick up kids for the night to have them drive them around the city of Boston to have them work for them. And then that kid may never see that particular person again. So that's sort of like in a nutshell, we're looking at, uh, you know, in the old days, what we were being told is maybe less than percent of boys were getting commercially sexually exploited and boys don't have, were pretty much not having pimps. But now what we know by recent Department of Justice uh, data is that we're looking at upwards of, th what we know so far is upwards of 38% of our victims of commercial sexual exploitation are male. And, uh, and we now know that boys are getting pimped as well. So, uh, when we look at the effects on our children who have been commercially exploited, I'll call that CSEC, which is our acronym, is um, we're looking at high rates of STIs and HIV, issues with anger management, and these are all, all key indicators also if you're dealing with males who fall into these categories around some form of sexual victimization. Uh, poor concentration and inability to focus, depression, PTSD, uh, inability to trust people, uh, high rates of substance abuse and academic underachievement. Most, I, I would say at least 90% of the boys that I had dealt with uh, when I was working for nonprofits is that they stated that in order to get through a night's work, and they worked every day, that they were high on some kind of substance. So they're always, so that's just really increasing the use of substances and uh, mental health issues that go along with that. So, um, still time? Okay, five minutes. Okay, so I want to tell you that it's like really critical as we move forward on reorganizing how we deal with males, especially male youth. And the one concern that I have um, is a lot of the kids that I've dealt with were labeled oppositional behavior disorder. So the focus of the treatment was controlling the behavior. And, well, you know, the adage of boys will be boys and whatnot. And so, like, even in residential work or foster care, where boys are quote unquote oppositional, the whole focus traditionally has been to control the behavior without necessarily looking at the underlying issues that brought the boy to that, those forms of behavior. And the one key area that no one ever really takes a look at is sexual victimization of some kind. Boys are just being bad. So, that really needs to be like a total culture shift when we're looking. And in my travels around the country in those states that have safe harbor laws, boys are still getting arrested under the age of 18 for petty crimes. So the, the law enforcement's getting around the law around arresting for petty crimes, which also happens for women. And um, so, or the boys are re-victimized. So the um, one adult survivor that I knew who was trafficked through um, 
Honduras was brought in, this, he was kidnapped out of Honduras and brought in through Mexico and up the uh, West Coast. He was a part of a trafficking team that had him and two women, and he was being trafficked out. The police, the FBI arrested, this, had a sting and arrested him in a Las Vegas hotel. The two women, he was not English speaking, so none of the people that arrested him were Spanish speaking. So uh, the two women were sent for services and he was arrested as a pimp. And he was in jail for three months before anybody figured out that he was not a pimp, but he was a victim. And this is not an uncommon story when these things are happening, uh, that victims are getting re-victimized by the criminal justice system and not hearing their story. He really clearly tried to explain. So it took like a three month period of time. And um, so in my private practice, I have a 45 year old man who's an adult survivor uh, taken to Guatemala. And he has several um, prostitution from when he was 18 to 21 before safe harbor laws came in, but he has several prostitution charges against him. And uh, so what his uh, trafficker, there was a trafficker with five boys. So what his trafficker did is if he couldn't be sold to a guy for a period of time, then the uh, trafficker would make them work the streets in Santa Monica. And that's where these kids were kept getting arrested. So he's got these charges against him, which really inhibit uh, moving forward with free movement in, in or out of the country. So um, there, there's one more quick story I want to tell you to, uh, well, I'm, really, I don't, I'm going to tell it anyway. Yeah. So I think um, one of the correlations that I was concerned about is I know with girls, uh, they really relate to their pimp as they call them their daddy, because despite any dysfunctional relationship they may have had within their home, uh, the, the pimp also is very nurturing and supportive, supportive in the early stages and really buys them nice gifts and really takes care of them. So I was really curious about the relationship between boys and their pimp. And um, I got a call two years ago from DCF in Boston about a boy that was uh, picked up at South Station with his pimp. And uh, luckily the transit police person in South Station recognized that this boy and this man were interacting in a way that made her get her uh-oh feeling. So she called the Boston police, they came out, they interviewed the kid and the guy. The kid was the DCF kid from Maryland, being brought from Massachusetts up to Maine. And um, so they interviewed the boy at the DCF office who was 13, the guy was I think 33. And um, so the boy was being questioned about, he knew that this was not appropriate, he knew something definitely was going wrong. And he goes, I know this was wrong, but he was such a good dad to me. So I thought that was interesting that, you know, now we can start transferring that dynamic between boys and their pimps of similarity to girls. So in rapping, I basically feel that I personally have found much more similarities between the female and male experience of trafficking than differences. Mm -hmm. And I think we kind of historically have felt, well, there's a lot of difference between those two genders and they're really, there's much more similarities than differences. So I hope we can be much more aware of that as we move on. Thank you. You can stay here for I was still just the <laughs> So we'll, we'll, um, we'll hold questions, but write them down if you have some questions for, for Stephen. Um, and now we'll have Matt. Um, thank you all for being here. So I'll kind of say the same thing. If anybody has questions, please feel free to note them down because I'll do my best to kind of stay on track and structure, but I think a lot of the nuances around conversations like this really best come out in dialogue. So I hope that as things come up, people will note them for the question and answer later on so that we can, can respond. Um, so I wanted to um, as Stephen mentioned, um, once we get kids, and I'm using kids, I use that term to super broadly, because otherwise young people, children, youth, it's kind of clumsy, so I'll just say kids. Um, once we get kids into services, 
what are some of the challenges we start to face? Um, certainly, it's been my experience as well that not disclosing is, is the norm. Um, and so I'm going to speak a little bit to some of the challenges that come from working with, with youth, with young men, um, with kids across a wide range of, um, of, of cases of, the, of adverse experiences, a wide range of multiple traumas, and what some of the challenges have been that I've experienced and what some of the approaches of, of my own and of the, the programs I've, I've worked with have, have been to address those. So my, my, my background in, in part, um, if you go back some years, um, was in classics and linguistics. I studied ancient languages. Mm -hmm. And there was this technique when you would write your, your, you know, your paper, your thesis, you'd always begin with this thing, fancy Latin word, status question, it's like the state of the question. Totally not necessary to use Latin, just say state of the question. Um, so I wanted to kind of begin with that. Like, what's the state of the situation that we're in right now? What's the state of the question? Um, one, I, so because of, part, partly because of that background, I came to this work initially as an educator. Um, and that has subsequently informed all that I do. Um, I work a lot with clinicians, with, with therapists, um, and with others from that kind of training, but my, my training tends to be more on an educational perspective. Uh, perspective. And so what I tend to look for, and there are a couple of aphorisms that, that stick out that have spoken to me over the years, and one um, that I hold dear to this day is the idea that all behavior is communication. And I think that this really speaks to what, what Stephen was saying a little bit earlier about noting some of these, about the, some of the failures, the structural failures of an assessment only methodology for sussing out some of these details. Um, and it's really important to pay attention to some of these behavioral indicators. And every anytime you're interacting with a survivor of complex and multiple traumas, especially to think, what is this behavior communicating to me? What are some of the things that I can interpret and use as a basis for how to work with this person ongoing. So all of the young people, all of the kids that I work with at present, because I work for a domestic violence agency, they all share that experience in some way. Um, what that means for each individual differs a lot. Um, and in particular, some of the kids, when you talk with them about domestic violence, if you were to ask them, have you experienced domestic violence? A certain number of them would say no. And that's always a really interesting to me because I come into it knowing things that they don't necessarily know that I know about their experience and their background. But it's, it, I think it highlights how important it is to use the terminology and to use the understanding that these victims and survivors are using themselves and not necessarily to voice the professional terminology that we might use upon them because it might not reflect the experiences that they, uh, that they have, um, have gone through. In fact, sometimes I have experienced the most helpful conversations when we don't assign a name to anything. It's the stuff that happened or the, th the things I experienced or some of that stuff back then. Really vague terminology that would reflect what that person, what that kid is comfortable dealing with right now. And so it's really important that we, as providers at a very beginning level, that we adapt and, and create a structure that is maximally adaptable to what makes sense and what makes meaning for the people we're working with. So I wanted to talk about four areas in particular that um, that are kind of uniform or, or fairly standard across the board that create a special challenges that have created special challenges um, in my experience when working with, with male survivors of some kind of complex trauma, which again for the young people I'm working with, there's always some kind of domestic violence, but often includes sexual victimization, sometimes trafficking, um, and any number of other related complex traumas. One thing that is almost uniform across, uh, across the board is isolation. Um, I had a camping trip with a bunch of the kids I worked with a couple of weeks ago, and one of the, Sharon Stephen, when we talked last week, one of the things that we that we talked about at one point late at night around the campfire was this idea of vulnerability. And we started talking about what is it, what is vulnerability? What does it take to create that? And who are the people in your life with whom you have that? You feel like you can just share anything that's on your mind. And to a person, every single one of the young men and one of the young women um, said that at max they have two people in their lives. Um, most of them said that they have one, and all but one said that those people were in that group. So outside of that group, which of I think eight or nine, they didn't have anyone in their lives with whom they felt that they could talk about these things. So that isolation is really key. Um, in particular with young men, 
um, and, 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 and males, when that presence is there, it's often sitting across from somebody, not sitting alongside. So a number of the kids in our programs have experienced a lot of therapeutic interventions, a lot of counselors, a lot of teachers, and a lot of people who have sat across from them, but not a lot of people who have sat alongside them. And that's an important, that's an important difference to understand. Um, when there have been relationships um, with, particularly with other men, it's, they've often been hierarchical. So there's been a structure, you know, and I'm reminded of the daddy kind of structure and how that hierarchical structure can very easily be manipulated and turned into something negative. Um, and they often aren't structures of, of parity, of equality, or structures where it's hierarchical one moment, but then it shifts to parity and equality in another moment. Um, even some service providers rely really strictly on a, a, a very, sometimes for the right reasons, but a very bounded approach where you know, here's, here's me and here's where I end and there's you and where you begin. You can sit over there and I'm going to sit behind my desk here and we're going to talk. And that's something particularly for, for young people um, who have experienced multiple traumas that, cannot, that isn't conducive to forming the relationships that tease out a lot of these really complicated experiences. Um, and then I think from a provider perspective, there's often an element of fear on the part of us as providers when we're, I mean, these kids who've been through things like this are not often, or not, not always really pleasant people to work with. Um, a lot of these behavioral indicators can come up as, when we talk about anger management, sometimes that means plain outright aggression. I mean, it can mean profanity, it can mean, you know, just verbal abuse and a lot of really difficult things as service providers to deal with. And I think it's important for us to locate our own subjectivity in those interactions. And I'm like, wow, this, this, this kind of makes me really uncomfortable, but what does that mean? That doesn't mean that I, I shut down. It doesn't mean that I stop working with this person or that I, I label them a perpetrator or a, a, a baby perpetrator, as I've sometimes talked about it when it comes to young men, in particular, who are survivors of complex trauma who are starting to enact really troubling behaviors. Um, and this is where I come back to that aphorism that I shared at the beginning, that all behavior is communication. And it's really important to understand what our own subjectivity is and then try to learn from whatever behaviors we're seeing exhibited. Um, let's see, trying to make sure that I stay on track. Um, oh, I was going to say in terms of the, of the isolation as well, um, young men in particular are there's, we're especially, I mean, all of us in many ways, but especially young men are subject to a real boxing of identities. Um, a lot of us, especially who work in prevention too, are familiar with that, that uh, metaphor of the man box. Um, all the things that you're supposed to be as a man put in the box and these things outside of the box and you get penalized and policed for stepping outside the box and there are all these different mechanisms for keeping you inside the man box. But there are a lot of other boxes as well that we don't often talk about that are just as real and can be just as stifling. Some of those boxes are things like the victim box, um, sometimes even the survivor box, um, because some of those boxes that have been constructed for groups and been helpful for some uh, groups in terms of naming and defining and giving voice to experiences over time can be silencing for other groups. Um, there's an abuser box, there's a, a perpetrator box, there's a criminal box, and particularly because of a lot of the factors that Stephen was talking about earlier, young boys and men who've experienced multiple traumas get put in a lot of those boxes. Um, the, the, what you were talking about earlier was put in the criminal box very, very easily, very automatically. And once those, once people's identities are boxed in in those ways, it can be really difficult for them to get out of that. So as providers, we have to find ways to, even in an attempt to give voice, to not repeat that boxing exercise. Um, and this is why, you know, even when, even though, like I said, with a lot of the young people I work with, even though I know from a professional perspective that all of them are what many of the, the mothers in our, our uh, client population would find in common terms of survivor of domestic violence, and virtually to a person, the kids don't use that term. And it feels, we've, talk, we've talked about it with, with a few of them, and it feels like a really heavy, confining because I mean, they're 10 years old, the idea that they've survived something at that point, it feels like I'm at the end of the journey. Like it feels weirdly retrospective for someone who's only just begun life. Um, and there are a lot of different reasons why, why they would feel that way for these other boxes too, and I wouldn't want to you know, try to describe all of them from here, but all of those boxes can be confining. Um, there are a lot of other 
ways that we as service providers can begin to define some of those experiences. So even when I use the term man or boy, um, usually when working with, with, with the, the kids I work with, I don't assume that, that means the same thing. I try not to assume that that means the same thing for each one of them. I'll say something like, like, what kind of man do you want to be? But I'll say, before we talk about that, let's talk about what that means for you. Like, what kind of man in your language do you want to be? Would you even want to be that? Let's, let's kind of break that apart at the beginning and then put it back together in a way that's meaningful for you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, using terms like the things you experienced, the, the, the stuff you've been through, the kind of things you've seen in your life so far. Um, or if they've been, um, instead of thinking, you know, a criminal or a youth offender or something like that, hearing some of the terms that, that young people use, one that, that pops to my mind really um, prominently is caught up. Like, have you been, you know, so I, I've been, I was caught up. Caught up in the system, they don't even say that, they just caught up. And I think it's really interesting to, to think about what does that mean and what, what kind of like freedom and freedom from some of those negative aspects of that identity does it give someone to say it's okay to use the term caught up. I'm not going to refer to you as a youth offender or someone who's been in the criminal justice system. Um, so hearing those terms and using them to give people some freedom to explore these ideas. Um, I also wanted to mention that, so the idea of power and control of is really familiar to us, I think all in this room and in these fields. Um, and I've toyed a long time and struggled with this idea of what does it mean when you're working with a a subset, a, a group that has a certain level of privilege and, and the associated power and control conferred by society, so male privilege, for instance. And how do you how do you get people who've been conferred privilege to give that privilege up when that privilege brings certain benefits? Um, and one of the things that has become more apparent to me over the years, especially working with kids, is that at the same time as privilege confers that power and control in an unasked for, unearned way, that's often an enormous burden for a young person, particularly for a young person who has experienced violence. That with the assumption of that privilege comes this overwhelming responsibility for upholding it. So when you think of male privilege and the unearned male privilege that comes to a, a boy who is a woman, maybe necessarily been identified as a man yet, there's this concomitant responsibility of like, oh God, like, yeah, I'm a man, I've got this power and control, like, oh God. I've got to demonstrate this power and control. I've got to like always make sure that everybody knows it. I can't ever be vulnerable. I can't ever show that I'm not in power, that I don't have control. And that's suffocating. And so it's it's really opened up in many ways for me a really bright space because I, I used to think in the past that it was a lot more difficult to get young men to give up some of this unearned privilege until I started realizing how many of them were looking for an opportunity to take that that, that burden off, to at least find a place where they could temporarily displace the heavy responsibility that came with trying to measure up, with trying to be enough, with trying to always demonstrate that they were worthy representatives of that power and control. And when provided with safe spaces um, and opportunities to put that down, the kind of openness that can arise is really, is really beautiful. Um, I'm going to do it on 10. We have five, four minutes. All right, great. So with that in mind, I wanted to talk about, as service provider, what can, and with, with some of those knowledge and some, some of that knowledge and some of those insights, what can we do in terms of incorporating that into the work, given that we all work in really diverse, different subsets of the field and really different ways with different populations that have different traumatic backgrounds. Um, and I wanted to suggest a couple of overarching ways of being that I think a lot of us can incorporate into our work. Um, one of them is, as I mentioned earlier, with isolation. I think from moving from isolation to a service model that prioritizes relationship and connection. And it's going to look different for everybody's community. It's going to look different for everybody's professional boundaries and restrictions and responsibility. But I think understanding, like I said, for me, that all, relation, all, all behavior is communication. What does that mean for, for your work? What does it mean for your particular job and your particular client base? Um, how can you find opportunities to create relationship and connection with the people that you're working with? And let, let kids know, I see you. I'm here with you. I'm not across from you, I'm alongside you. I hear you. Your experience is real, it's important, and it's meaningful. 
and giving them the opportunity with that basis being understood to begin to, ident to identify and to create meaning and create terms and create language around it themselves that's, that provides a path forward that isn't boxing in in those ways that I talked about. Um, from that classic you know, power and control um, that I talked about earlier, figuring out ways to disrupt hierarchy and interchange hierarchy and, and parity, where sometimes, yeah, you're understanding I'm the service provider, and I have certain responsibilities up here, and you're the client, and you have certain you know, requirements and restrictions here, but I'm going to try to find ways to set us alongside each other so that, that those kinds of hierarchies and social structures that rely on traditional power and control, traditionally privileged, traditionally masculine power and control, don't get replicated in any space where we can avoid it. And again, from isolation and boxed identities to move more and more towards creating within individuals and a community opportunities for, for pride of shame, opportunities to own experience and to, to find ways of not suffering in silence and to find ways of, of making it okay to be vulnerable, making it okay to, to, to try and to fail. Um, and overall, a general service model that's open-ended that prioritizes giving forward, giving back, and the creation of community. And I think I'll hold off there because I think a lot of the, the questions that, that I hope people are writing down, things I can, I can kind of answer with some more ideas of how people can do that within their individual communities and client populations, um, and taking some of these general principles and responses and making them particular to your work and your situations. Thank you. Great idea. Um, so, do you write down questions? So next, um, let's share. So I'm going to actually plug my agency really quickly. So I work at the Boston Area Great Crisis Center, which covers this area, and I serve as there. And we offer services for men. Um, we also offer in individual couples and group services for men survivors. So when you make time, we just shave my plug and a brochure in the back right there. So thank you. <laughs> So what I'm going to ask you to do is to put your pens and pencils down, put your paper down, put your feet on the floor. We're going to start with some activity. Okay? So just take a moment. That's definitely one. Take a few breaths. Close your eyes if you're comfortable. If not, look at a spot in front of you. Someone comes to you and tells you they were raped. They tell you the perpetrator was someone that they know. And open your eyes. Let's talk about this. I read a scenario. How many of you, when I said um, someone comes to you and tells you they were raped, pictured a female? Whether it's a female that you might know, a female form or a female energy? Okay, great. When I said perpetrator, how many of you pictured a male or a male form or some male energy? I do that. I do that too. So I have a lot of coffee. So just let me know if you're talking. I do that too. Yes, I. Okay. So I think what's important is that we are here to challenge the idea that only women are victims and that men are perpetrators. I think what the hard thing is, is particularly thinking about men, adult men, who experience sexual violence as adults, is that we then have to recognize that men are victims and that women can be perpetrators. Seeing a lot of head nods, so everyone's sort of agreeing with that. But if you stop and you think about that exercise, our fir first place that we go is women are victims, men are perpetrators. And I'm here to completely change that thought for you, to change your perspective around that. That men can be victims and women can be perpetrators. And let me just show you how important perspective is and why I'm going through this. Everyone see this? Everyone see what it says? It's the word broken. And a lot of survivors will use this term to describe themselves. You use this term to maybe describe yourself or to describe something, an object that you might have actually broken. You've seen this word a million times, right? If not a million trillion times, infinity. I want you to look at the word again, and I want you to look at the middle of the word broken and tell me what you see. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> How many of you have seen that before? So what I've just done is changed your perspective. You've looked at something and been taught to look at something one way. 
I ask you to look at it a little bit differently and now change your perspective of this word from now on. That's a great party trick. Sorry. Okay, that's a great party trick. Um, but what the point is, is that I'm here to talk about adult men who experience sexual violence as adults. And I think that's a hard concept for us to really internalize and to think about. And so I'm here to change your perspective. What I want you to do is I want you to be really thoughtful and pay attention to what's going on for you internally. What tends to happen when I do these trends is people get very defensive or very angry or very d d like resistant to the idea. And I don't totally understand that. But what's important to know is when you have that resistance and when you have that defensiveness, that means a change is coming. And so hopefully after this is you'll understand that men as adults can experience sexual violence and what that might actually look like. So perspective is really important. So again, great party trip. <laughs> Okay. So to go back to what Matt was talking about, the idea of that box that we talked about. So we're going to do a little bit of brain design, because I can only talk about so much. <clears throat> now, I apologize now for my handwriting and my spelling. <laughs> All right. Awesome. So let's talk about stereotypes or ideas about men. Strong. Strong. Protectors. Protector. Provider. Provider. Non-emotional. Non-emotional. I did this training just yesterday. Same four ones came up first. Wow. <laughs> Aggressive. Compet competitive. Sorry. Competitive. Competitive. Did you see power? Unfaithful. Unfaithful. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard something else. Power. Power. Um. How much to test test off? It's too hard for me to start to obtain it. I would dare to add gentle. Gentle? Do, do it. That's it. Yeah, I feel like sometimes, um, and I feel like it's referred to when you think of men for like large, that people might say, oh, it's a gentle giant, which is not a pretty short So, So it brings up the idea around physical aspects, like physically bigger. Passionate. Passionate. Leader. Leader. King. I'm sorry? King. King. That's that right? Yeah. They have like the like frat boy sometimes. That oh, you know, like the the Part of Animal House. The sex free. The <laughs> sex free. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Initiator. Initiator. <clears throat> All right, now we're going to switch gears. One more thing. So let's go take one. Dumbass. No, I, <laughs> I was actually going to say asshole. But... <laughs> Sorry, guys. I, I actually facilitate men's groups. That's okay. You've and... got a gun. I know. <laughs> You've got the gun. And it's usually what comes out, and the men are like, wow, we are terrible people. It's <laughs> not true. Right. No. But again, we're talking about stereotypes. Right. All right? So let's talk about what a victim is. <laughs> Huh. What are stereotypes of victims? Powerless. Silent. I'm so sorry about my spelling. Sorry. Scared. Okay. Weak. Okay. <coughs> Damaged. Vulnerable. Traumatized. Broken without the okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Broken. Low self esteem. Yeah. Self sympathy. 
PTSD. Alright. So I want everyone to take a moment and look at the list. And tell me what you notice. None of the same words? I don't think no, it's just, yeah, the opposite. 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 The opposite, right. How do you think this impacts men's abilities to see themselves as victims? Huge. How? They feel ashamed. They feel ashamed. It's not in the man box. Right. How does this also impact their ability to disclose that they've experienced sexual violence? Embarrassed. Embarrassed? I worked with somebody once who felt like he, he, he said this to me that he felt like he could still be a man as long as a man never found out if he only ever disclosed to women. Yeah, I mm-hmm. see that. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. There's no permission in the stereotypical world to be any of those things. They're supposed to be all those other things. So they can't even identify themselves as that. Exactly. Now, if I was to ask you to talk about stereotypes of women, what do you think would happen? Would they get closer to the idea of victim? If I actually talk about stereotypes of gay men, where do you think that would fall? Victim. Mm-hmm. Right? So really recognizing that anyone can experience sexual violence and anyone can perpetrate sexual violence is us as the responders who are responsible to change people's perspectives. This is something that occurs. Now, how do you think these things actually make men vulnerable to sexual trauma? Mm, Trapped by shame. Trapped by shame? They're set up to not disclose. Mm -hmm. And this is just a question again. I wanted to know um, how, sort of, what our stereotypical idea of men might actually make them more vulnerable. They will never expect it to happen for them. Mm-hmm. They won't be able to watch it. So it's interesting, right? I'm not here to compare and contrast survivors, but when I think about how to understand this, women, the statistics are one in three. So as a woman, you better expect to be sexually assaulted, so you, know, you need to know what to do to protect yourself. Yeah. If you're not expected to be assaulted, you're never taught what to do to protect yourself, right? However, they both experience shame. Women experience shame because I didn't protect myself or do enough. Mm-hmm. And men is, I must not be a man. So it's very different ways of looking at it. Right? So there are some things that are really important for us to think about as we move forward. Any other thoughts or ideas so far what we're talking about? I think often in like prevention, if um, boys or men aren't expressing the vulnerabilities, as service providers, we can't provide that supports around them to prevent, prevent maybe some larger things from happening so that they're not exposing other vulnerabilities who may not be able to identify them. Mm-hmm. Right. Or making them more vulnerable because again, it's not supposed to happen in that. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking about the boomerang effect. So if a man is abused, if I was, I'm a man in that category and I'm abused, I would want to like prove that I am by drinking and drugging my shame and by being violent to prove, so how are you a man? Well, you're a man by drinking and beating people up. So I would do that in spades to make up for the shame that I feel for being victimized. I have not talked about those behaviors. Mm-hmm. And for a lot of uh, people, they may only have their aggression available to them. And for men, it's okay to be angry, not sad. They yeah, might exactly. cover up their sadness with their anger, but yeah, so they have this need to sort of be hyper You might see weightlifting, yeah. you might see men who go into positions or jobs that are actually very physical. I had a man that I worked with that was in the military, was a boxer in the military, left the military, became a police officer, that was dangerous enough, and then became a firefighter. Really trying to gain that masculinity back. Yeah, I would say a lot of men don't disclose because you hear it all the time that men can't do it. Exactly. Right. And it's not true. You know, we have to be prison. And that's usually the stereotype. Or military. Military and prisons. And it does. Don't get me wrong, but it also happens in day to day society. So I'm going to blow your minds right now. <laughs> okay, if I haven't already. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the, actually, the FBI, and I, I might have the date wrong, but in 2012, the FBI changed the definition of rape to take out gender. Mm-hmm. So awesome. what they have forgotten to put in was forced to penetrate. 
When you think about men who've experienced sexual violence, they might have been forced to penetrate someone else. That does not fit the definition of rape or sexual assault. So men don't even see themselves sometimes in the definition. So we're talking about a female perpetrator and a male survivor. You might be talking about forced to penetrate men on men too. But that idea, and if they don't see themselves in the definition, they're not seeing themselves as victims. And again, we have to change that. We also have to sort of broaden our perspective on what sexual violence actually is. And a lot of time, coercion is used. And I think we forget that. That coercion is basically saying, well, you're not a man. If you were a man, you would do this. Let's think about how often on television shows and in movies, when it's a female on a male, it's funny. There's a whole movie, Horrible Bosses, based on that. Yeah. Ah, it's supposed to be funny. It's not. It's actually sexual harassment, it's rape and sexual assault. But it's not identified as that. And we need to change that perspective, yeah. that it actually is. And letting men know that they can be victims and giving them permission to be victims and to disclose is really important. But what stops us from being able to do that, right? There's a couple of things. Number one, men can experience sexual violence. I know you've probably have heard the term a million times, but sexual violence is about power and control and not about sex. But what does that mean? Let me ask you, how many of you here are parents? How many of you here have ever had younger siblings you had to babysit? How many of you here ever had to be a, like a supervisor and supervise someone in their work? Hope everybody's raised their hands at least once. Let's think about this. You are babysitting some child and you really want to watch your movie because your favorite television show, Supernatural, is on. And you really want to watch it. Uh, but the kid won't go to sleep. How does that feel? Frustrating. Frustrating. Right. When they go to sleep and they go to sleep on time and they're quiet and you get to watch your television show, how does that feel? Impossible. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Impossible. All right, so when it does happen, how does that feel? Amazing. Amazing. So what you're telling me is you know exactly how it feels to have power and control over somebody else mm -hmm. and how powerful that makes you feel. Mm -hmm. Now you know what we mean. Isn't that right? So it's all about power and control and not about sexual desire. Let's think about this for a second. Most men who assault other men actually identify as heterosexual. With misconception, it identifies heterosexual. Let's stop and think about power and control for a second. If you wanted to gain the ultimate power and control over somebody, you are going to sexually violate them. But if you want the ultimate power and control, are you going to sexually assault a woman or a man? Man. Wow. Yeah. You are going to assault a man. More power, more control. Can you repeat your question again? Absolutely. So if you are want to gain the ultimate power and control, are you going to sexually assault a woman or a man? Mm. So male sexual victimization makes sense. Mm. How am I doing on time? Yeah. You get five minutes. So there's some things I want to sort of just bring to light. I'm going to be, just be very direct when I talk about these things. Is there are some things that men might experience during sexual violence that are very confusing for them. Now, men can have a physical reaction to sexual violence. Women can too, but it's not as visible. So men can have an erection and can ejaculate. It does not mean your sexual desire is actually a physical reaction. Most people do not know that, actually. And so when somebody has a physical reaction to that and it's pointed out to them, that is actually a way to blame them and provide shame to them and manipulate what they're experiencing in that moment. Most people do not know that. It's not about sexual desire. Again, it's about power and control. And for the perpetrator, I'm mean, sorry, the victim, it's not about that either. There's actually just a physical response, but it is very confusing. So you think about that, and you add to what I said before, is that forced to penetrate is also part of rape and sexual assault. And they're thinking they must have wanted it because they had an erection. But again, it can happen. No, honestly, when the wind blows, isn't that the joke? Mm -hmm. Now, there's a, I'm assuming there's a lot of women in the room, and I want us to think about the fact that it occurs to us too. You could be sitting somewhere and just shift a little bit, and you might become stimulated. Does it mean that you want sex at that moment? It's just a physical reaction. But for men, it's visible, and therefore it's used against them. And we're thinking about that. People automatically assume that sexual violence against men is by determined sexual orientation. As I've said before, um, rape is not about a sexual desire. It's not to do with sex, it's power and control. It's not determine anyone's sexual orientation. But I think that men question their sexual orientation when it comes to that. They're actually not together. When I do these trainings, too, one thing that also comes up for people is that the question of perpetration always comes up. I do a lot of trainings, and when I do basic sort of overarching trainings around sexual violence, it doesn't come up. When I do specific male survivor trainings, it comes up. 
For men, I think the difficulty in disclosing also, people automatically assume if you've experienced sexual violence as a man, you're then going to become a perpetrator. There are a large number of survivors who are off of perpetrators, but not all perpetrators, not all um, survivors of perpetrators. Right. That's like in those SAT questions, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, there is no <laughs> statistical evidence to show that men who experience sexual violence become offenders. No. It's an assumption that has been passed along down, you know, down the road. Actually, it shows that if men who've experienced neglect and physical abuse are actually more likely to become sexual offenders. Sort of my understanding is that if you've experienced sexual violence, you don't want anyone else to experience that. That's also a myth that is perpetuated. And I also want to add, too, that men who've experienced sexual violence are just as traumatized as anyone else who's experienced sexual violence, but they are taught not to do it, right? To not be emotional, so using drugs and alcohol, and even sex, as ways of sticking it down. So as you can see, what we're doing in perpetuating all these ideas that men cannot be victims, perpetuating the idea of what is a man and what is a victim, is actually perpetuating sexual violence against them. So I'm just going to end the Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for the disruption. Um, somebody, that was awesome. Some, just quick announcement. Somebody has a white Dodge parked in the back parking lot. I don't know if it's anyone here. Um, the parking space face the other direction from yeah. the building. It's a white Dodge, uh, the license plate number. So that's re resident parking on that far side of the parking lot. So somebody is that one in their spot back. So on this side, you can double park or um, there's a couple spots around. The same for the sign that's named as a church. I can double pop it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. Thank you. So the, the woman is there on the back. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. So <laughs> next we have, uh, last but not least, Mikel. <laughs> to come up and, and share. Thank you. This podium is perfect for me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to use it so I can stick to my script, otherwise I, there, there's so much to cover that to stay in 20 minutes would be difficult. So <clears throat> I'm going to speak as a therapist. This is not an academic presentation. I'm speaking as a clinician who's worked with men for the entirety of my career. And as you can see, that's a long career. So, first thing I want to talk about was something that I saw in Jonathan Shea's book, Deaths in America. Jonathan Shea uh, used to work at the VA here in Boston. He was a a man that worked with combat, prolonged combat PTSD. And he had a list of unintended consequences of prolonged combat. And I'm going to read them off to you because every single one of his list fits a male survivor. Control of fear. Cunning, the art of deception, the art of the mind fuck, rigidity about oneself. They can't, they're not always all of these applied to everyone, but just think about it. Endurance, skill in adapting to harsh physical conditions, the capacity to respond instant, instantly with violent lethal force or a tendency to shut down in situations of conflict. Hypervigilance, perpetual mobilization for danger, and overvigilance regarding children. A suppression of feelings or immense flooding, dissociative responses. The suppression of tenderness, usually to yourself in particular. Negligent self-care, 
addiction to sex, work, alcohol, exercise, internet, danger, exaggerated risk-taking behavior, or the, the fear of taking any risk in any new situation. The cycling between overexcitement and numbness. Mistrust of men, mistrust of women, distorted sexual relationships with men and with women, an extreme need for control or calm. So who is a male survivor? And I'm talking about an adult male survivor. Stephen asked me to talk about this, the, the developmental stages of a male survivor. We've, we've heard about children and adolescents. All that is encompassed in, a, in an adult male survivor, especially one who's not done any kind of work, any kind of treatment. Is the, the child and the adolescent is stuck somewhere inside of them. So he could be 21, he could be 75. And in my practice, he's black, Latino, Asian, Indian, American Indian, frat boy, military guy, priest, choir master, CEO, homeless dude, cop. He's the whole thing. He has a lot of initials in the back of his name. He has more tattoos than you can count. Um, or he looks so clean cut, you, you couldn't imagine that he would ever be, and stand so buffed or so together, you couldn't imagine that he was so compromised. And why is he there, right? Why does he come to see me? It isn't always, although at this point in my, my time, people kind of know what I do, so I might not see somebody right away uh, that would know what, I'm, what we're gonna be up to or what he's gonna really be there for. And he might be there because he's having trouble in his marriage. His world just fell apart. He's got no friends. He's lost his children. He's lost his way. Um, he's been living a lie about his sexual identity, his sexual orientation, and there's a difference. His sexual anything and certainly his sexual abuse. He may not call what happened to him sexual abuse. He may just think he got lucky or that thing that just happened when he was young. He's here because he can't stop his nightmares, his flashbacks, his rage attacks. He's stuck, he can't stop in all the addictions especially internet porn. That's, the, that's one that's really got people by the throat. We've got a lot of stuff to cover, he says. And I have to promise him some things. But first I have to tell him to test me. Because I have to earn his trust. Just because I'm a therapist uh, doesn't have anything to do with, oh, now you can trust me. Because a lot of times people have gone to many people like us and they got nowhere. So no games, no bullshit, no flinching. He asks me a personal question and we have to revisit the boundaries. No bullshit, I promised. I tell him this is a laboratory. We go over all the stuff. Race, I, here I am, I'm a white, little white lady with white hair, you know, what's it like for you to be talking to me? Um, gender, health, sexuality, spirituality, religion, and they're not the same thing, by the way. Um, and how we're gonna work together. We're gonna negotiate safety. I can't promise him safety. As I said, I have to earn safety. Just interrupt for a second. Yeah. I'm so sorry, but there's another car that's parked in the resident parking. It's a black Toyota. Oh, that's me. That's you? I, I oh, I'm, uh, I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. Um, uh, do you want to give me your key or something? Yeah. Can I can it's a, it's an E37, the black Toyota. I'm so sorry about that. Not black Toyota. I want to get it to you. 
Thank you very much. It's like, it's one of those ones where you put it on and then the motor just can go on. Thank you. On this side of the parking lot. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you. So, where am I? So here he is. He's mighty. He's arrived on a bunch of prescription meds, antidepressants, stimulants, anticonvulsants, mood stabilizers. Sometimes he has nothing to do with medication. He's sick or he's physically debilitated. Um, if he's here because of his addictions, we have to go down to the root of where addictions come from. And I don't know if you've ever read Gabor Mate. I believe the book was, um, what's his book? Uh, I should have had it here. Yeah, Gabor come. Mate is a, is a Canadian therapist who wrote about addiction. But one of the things that was so important about what he was writing about was that addiction always has a cause. There's always an it. There's always something we're covering up. 99% of the time, addiction has to do with trauma. Trauma is not always sexual trauma. It can be neglect. It could be physical abuse. It could be everything. Sometimes sexual abuse is sort of the, the last straw. It's sort of only a piece of what's happened. Mm -hmm. It's all too much, he says. You know, all that shit happened. So then there's not, then he may have to do with the fact he's not sure what he remembers. We know that memory is not linear. Memory is like shards of glass. It's hard to speak of a de developmental stages when you're dealing with memory. Because memory can be a voice, a scream, a smell, a sound. It can be an exchange it could be a word. It could be just the way the, the office smells. Memory is color. It's taste. Memory is many, many things. And some of the places that this man is working from is where he's stuck in his memory and it's not conscious. So he's stuck at 11 years old in that room, in that garage, in that basement. He's stuck, and all he needs is one word, and there he is. Or he goes into a blank. The mind has forgotten, Freud said this, the mind has forgotten, but the body has not, thankfully. So what do we do? We have to do a lot of things, uh, and this takes time to, to maybe get to what he's really trying to get at. Right? Sometimes we have to do some body stuff. Sometimes we do art. Sometimes I play him some music. Sometimes he plays me some music. Sometimes he brings his dog and he holds his dog and then he can talk about what happened to him. Um, the story of abuse is revealed layer by layer. And like I say, it's not just sexual violation. So we go through the lifespan. Maybe we go through every decade of his life. Um, Peter Levine, I don't know if you guys sure. ever know who he is, he, yeah. he does, uh, not Peter Levine, actually it was Stephen Levine. Stephen Levine, they're not related. Stephen Levine did a lot of work with the dying, and he wrote a book called Unattended Sorrow. It's a wonderful book, not well written, but beautifully, but beautifully portrayed, about how sorrow stacks up. When we don't attend to one thing, it stacks up on top of the next thing, and the next thing. And that's really the story of trauma. When we're 11 years old, we don't deal with the thing, or our parents decide that they're never going to talk about it, or they're part of, the, part of the problem, or that's not the way in our culture, our family, our religion, our, you know, our men's club, then it stacks up until the next thing happens, and the next thing happens. So every decade, every developmental stage, every birth of your child, stacking up, stacking up. 
So he's angry, he's fearful, he's shut down, he feels too much, he doesn't feel a bit, he's numb. And then he has to look at this therapy thing. He goes, well, why do I have to prove myself? Why do I have to talk to you? Why is it so important what other people think? Why is it so important what men think? Why is it so important what you think? What do I do with all these feelings? What do I do with this goddamn shame? And by the way, shame and pride, they're doppelgangers of each other. Shame and pride. And then there's what we call moral moral injury. And I think for traffic boys, this is one of the most difficult pieces. He tells me, and maybe it'll take a long time, that he participated in hurting people. He hurt people. He watched other people do things to other people. He did shit to other people. He's, he's done harm. He shied away from watching other people do harm. He never said anything. And he carries that. And that's maybe more debilitating than feeling like a victim. That he himself did bad things to other people. He may not name what's happened to him. And like I said earlier, he may romanticize it because his predator, his perpetrator, his pimp, his priest, his father, his mother was the only person he could ever talk to, the only person he ever felt close to. And it just so happened that they violated him too. So he's loyal. He has to be loyal. He has to be loyal to his family because if he tells anybody or anything about what's happened to him, it's going to break up his family. It's going to break up his marriage. It's going to break up the church. It's going to break up uh, the synagogue. There's so much, and there's so much to grieve. Sometimes none of this is going to show up until somebody dies, his parent, his perpetrator. Sometimes it doesn't show up until it comes up in his body, in his bones, in his heart condition. And if he was violated as an adult, double shame, the things that Sharon talked about. Men aren't supposed to be able to, adult men being raped. I think one of the most striking things was watching, uh, uh, listening to a guy who was so freaked out because he was raped by a woman as an adult. He was raped by a woman. And he was so freaked out that this could even happen to him. And he couldn't put his mind around it. He didn't know how to talk about it. And he was trying to talk about it in front of a woman. So there was yet another layer. What if he enjoyed his abuse? What if he felt pleasure? What if he was seduced? It wasn't violent. It was kind of wonderful. It was his first introduction to sex, and it was the best sex he ever had. What is he going to do when he has to think about the fact that this creates a shift in his brain? We talk about neuroplasticity, you know how the brain is one way and then shit happens and the brain's over here and I tell him, well, we're doing brain surgery, you know what? It happened, here's your brain over here, now we're going to just do this, you know? But it's going to take some time to change the brain to actually realize what's happened to me was actually abuse. It wasn't good for me. He has to grieve for what he's lost. He has to perhaps change some of the long-held beliefs that have helped him function in the world. He has to deal with the loneliness attached to that and the confusing mishmash of all of this in one place. Sometimes psychotherapy is disruptive, very disruptive, especially in the beginning. So how do we create a space they can tolerate that till we get to the other thing? I don't want them to, to be in a abreactive state 
they have to feel empowered. How do we keep that feeling of being empowered and reminding them that what they've been through is actually part of who they are as men? <clears throat> I'm, I'm interrupting myself because I'm, I'm also thinking of something none of us have mentioned in, in our four of us, and that's the trans community. Because they have nowhere to put themselves. Oftentimes, trans men have nowhere to put themselves. And I have had, I, I'm thinking of one homeless man that I worked with. He was, uh, um, he was a trans man. He'd had a botched operation. He was homeless. And when he started to unpack why he became why he transitioned, it was because he hated the woman that was raped so much he had to identify with the perpetrator. <clears throat> and he had an operation, and then he regretted his, his transition. And other people, that's not why. They transitioned because they that was absolutely appropriate. But a lot of times, the trans community has nowhere to put themselves. You know, we talk about male survivors, we talk about female survivors. And then we have people who identify as one or the other, and people who don't identify as either, and they're, they, they have nowhere to go. So I just want to put that out there as survivors. This is something we have to be aware of. Um, I think the, how much time do I have? Where am I? Because I'm going three minutes? Oh, dear. OK. So here are my dilemmas, and I'll do this really quickly. I'm going to give you questions, because then maybe we can talk about this in our vast amount of time we have left. <laughs> How do I educate my male survivor client to recognize the paradigms that's playing out with me? How do I inform him without proselytizing? How do I tease out his cultural markers, the racial markers, the, the family of origin stuff, from the abuse stuff. Sometimes certain cultures deem something abuse and other cultures don't. How do I remain non-defensive, curious and consistent no matter what he says to me? Because a lot of times guys are going to come in and they're going to do whatever they can to completely freak me out. Because they just figure on them and me. How do I help him look at his conflicts or double binds, his beliefs, his needs about shame, without shaming him? How do I not enable him or become too matronly or motherly with him and yet provide a reparative space for him where he feels that safe? There's, a, there's something that as a clinician I have to pay really close attention to. Boundaries are important, but boundaries in relationship. And that is altogether a whole new thing for guys. A lot of men have been sexually abused. They go, they don't know how to differentiate between, and I dare use the word love, love, and sex. They don't know what to do with that. So how are we going to parse that out? How am I going to invite this man to have respect? I can't, I, I've learned early on, you can't tell people, you have to love yourself. It's like, bullshit, I love myself. You know, you, you can't ask them to have compassion. That's the new word for them. They roll their eyes, you know, compassion. So what I ask them to do is have some respect for what they've been through. Have as much respect for what they themselves have been through as what anyone else that they would be supporting has been through. And hence, that's why I try to put most of the men that I work with in groups, why weekends of recovery are so important, or something where men can create a group with another men. And I'm, I'm now mixing my gender groups. I have men and women in the same group, which is amazing. Everyone's freaked out when they walk into the room. 
-hmm. And what happens when people feel that they, somebody else gets it, that then they can feel safe. It's not a therapist, well-meaning as we all are, or whatever our designations are. When they're in the company of other people and feel empowered to speak their truth and not be stuck in, I'm a victim, not even be stuck as a survivor, but be stuck, but not be stuck, be free as people, that's when real recovery takes place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I end with what I kind of tried to start with, 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 which is the work that you do with men, and I'm looking at mostly women in this room, has got to start with your own relationship and your relationship with yourself to be honest and true. To be honest and true. That's the port to that to recovery. That's awesome. <laughs> so we have about 20 minutes for some questions and discussion time. Um, so let's let's start. Um, anybody want to be the first question? have something that you wrote down and you can direct it to anyone or you can direct it to a specific person you share. And it's a lot to teach them. Yes. Yeah. Um, the gentleman here was speaking and I was thinking the same thing about what, what about transgenders? What about males who just are physically a male but don't identify with males and they're still going through it? How do I do it? And, and that whole box thing. And um, I, it was just interesting what you were saying, because everything you were saying was pertaining to someone who identified as a male and maybe use leave home because they're struggling with their gender identity. So I was just curious. Well, I have a client right now. Um, I won't reveal his political persuasion, but it, it factors into the therapy, he is a white male, father of six, um, lives in an all-white community on purpose, is extremely homophobic, and will say that word, he's very homophobic, uh, and he goes on and on about everybody else who isn't a white, heterosexual man. And it took about a year for him to reveal to me that actually he wants to be a girl. And actually, the girl is in the room. And that's, but the girl is the one who was abused. And the girl is the one who wants to have sex all the time. So we are trying to tease out his sexual identity, his sexual orientation, his sexual abuse as a girl in a body of a 13-year-old and he's 15 some years old. So there's so many layers of this mm -hmm. to try to unpack and it makes it safe enough for the girl to come forward. And I keep telling her that until she can grow into the woman she needs to be, he can't be the man he, he wants to be. Uh, it's a, it, it, you know, it's very interesting and, and necessary, but my question was really to Matthew. You oh, talked about sorry. assessment, and as if whoever's sitting in front of him, in front of him, is identifying as being a girl, which I believe sometimes are not, and have, don't have the permission or the safety or have experiences or interactions to like figure out, well, I'm not sure. So I was just more mm -hmm. curious about it. Sorry. That's mm -hmm. okay, because that's important stuff. That's what's going to too. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking there are a couple of kids that I'm working with right now who um, have identified as gender non-binary. Um, and that's the, I think, the big kid, which sometimes we, um, I mean, they're, that's, and that's the term that each one of them has independently kind of said, you know, this is, this reflects. Um, so fortunate that those kids found a place even learn that language. That right, exactly. That's where it was and one of them I've, I've known since, um, 
since they didn't use that particular term, so it's unfortunate enough to kind of be a part of the process of like, yeah, I'm experiencing this. What is going to talk about just a little bit, and and so with within the within the group and some of the stuff that's taking some of the conversations are taking place within a group dynamic, um, and some of them are taking place individually. I mean, I always and when I talk to kids who are you know, very clearly in the, yep, I'm a guy, yes, I'm a boy, yes, I'm a, I'm a girl, that kind of, of, of camp, and when we, and especially when we mix groups all together, um, I really encourage people to sort of radically reflect what each person brings to the table. So if someone, even if you might not understand it, um, if someone comes to the table and says, this is, this is how I, this is, this is me today. I don't even want to say how I identify, because even that takes a step back. Yeah. This is who I am today. This is who I am. Just okay, great. Like, and I think that we've created um, within like that group a culture where that's been radically true. I mean, I would even move away from some of the term like male identify or female identify. You know, male, female. It's simple in some ways. Um, and so I think having that like radical just reflection of the truth um, uh, as people own it for themselves as they articulate it um, is. It, in some ways, it, it, it takes the um, uh, it, it, it puts the question back in, in the right place, which is like on the on how how to work with the things that that happen to you, not on you know whether or not this space is for you, or whether or not this conversation is for you, because this conversation is absolutely for you. Mm -hmm. I see. I think so. And so that would be really fair. Um, so people who are identified as transgender are the statistics are one and two. All right, so I think it's really important to be broad and open up that anyone can experience sexual violence and their experiences their own. I'm going to be thoughtful about that. I work with a lot of trans individuals, and um, particularly in my men's group, and it's, it's difficult because I think there's this um, there's a shift, but I think also for a certain generation that if they don't see the word men or male survivor, they will not see themselves. Right, so there's definitely that piece that needs to be addressed and thought of. And for the trans men, for the men's group, they see themselves as men, and that's how they identify. So it's being really thoughtful about and not saying like why do we use and how we talk about people who identify, but there's just a lot of nuances to all of it and really paying attention to it. Um, writing sources to everyone. And I want to again reiterate that what Michelle says, I think it's really important because people get very confused. People who are transgender are not transgender because they experience sexual violence. And that is a misconception that's out there. And the trans community will say that that's not the case. And I think that a lot of trans individuals are afraid of getting therapy because that's what they're afraid they're going to hear. Mm -hmm. And just knowing that that's, again, not mm -hmm. something really open. Mm -hmm. Hi, I thought something that was very interesting on um, the talk so I'm sorry to forget your name, was this broken in the hierarchy um, as service providers and organizations. And I think that's very important. You could elaborate a little bit more about what that means in particular around male victimization. Mm -hmm. So I think, and again, I think it's going to look really different depending on where everybody's mm -hmm. location is. So just speaking from my location, I think um, working work working with the kids that I work with, I I deliberately try as much as possible not to to, to create uh, kind of coin this this idea of like um, how, how was I thinking about it today. Um, deliberate failure on my part um, to create um, to create an environment where get, there's, a, there's a reflex a lot of times when there's, when there's a vacuum in that hierarchy for, for kids who have had these really unhealthy or empty vacant spaces to look up to. There's a tendency, I think, even when we are sort of trying to do the right thing, for them, for, for the, the, the kids we're working with to take us and put us in that space. And because we are here, most of us, all of us, all of us, because we're trying to do the right thing in some capacity, we want to fulfill that responsibility because it's a, to, to ultimately in, in the abstract, it's a good thing. Um, but there's a problem, you know, with, with being sort of put into that hierarchical structure because that structure carries with it so much baggage and so much potential for replicating harm, totally unintentional. And so I look, if I work with any individual, I kind of try to see like the trajectory of behaviors and responses, and if I feel in some way like I'm delivering too much, mm -hmm. I'll create deliberate failure for myself to live up to those expectations. Mm -hmm. As hard as that is for me, because it sucks, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as hard as that is, I recognize that it also is a key piece to building resiliency. 
um, because I'm creating the norm going forward where failure in a situation doesn't mean failure of a relationship. Mm -hmm. um, it's the opposite. And so that it, it builds the, the tendency over time for failures to be okay and to not be indicative of the, of the failure of the connection. Failure of that. Thank you. <coughs> when you're working with male victims, regardless of how you work in, it's a constant battle against hierarchy mm -hmm. based on gender bias, homophobia, and sex. Why do you answer for some reason? Why is that? Because there's a lack of awareness uh, male victims. Yeah. Yeah. And in the chat, we you know, there's a myth that it just happens to gay boys, mm -hmm. and it's right and that's it. And a majority of boys that are trafficked are not gay. Because there's just many more non gay boys than gay boys. Although, proportionately, 40% of gay boys so are trafficked. So, so that, put, that puts the non gay boys in the front. They don't want to be identified as being gay. So, then they grow up with all that trauma and all that. So, they talk about the psychological connection. So, there's massive hierarchical dilemmas. Based, based on working with males. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you, kind of along those lines, and I'm kicking myself out of your presentation. But um, I work as a, a housing based manager in a housing program, so I case in 31 men that are identified as the most vulnerable of the homeless population in Brockton, in particular, and prioritized for subsidized housing. Um, and through my work, I've come to learn from all of them over time. All 31 have actually experienced sexual trauma at some point, um, and they kind of directly connect that to their homelessness, um, which is really fascinating because we're not a trauma center or a sexual trauma center at all. People present with a variety of different presentations, um, and it was just kind of amazing to find out over time that every single one of them you know has this close so they've been through this in some form um oftentimes i am that authoritative figure in the sense that i'm the one um who's helping them maintain the expectations that come with remaining in housing and not repeating homelessness i'm the one enforcing rules i'm the one taking drugs and alcohol away i'm the one calling the police um things like that and um, I think something that you said that I've just learned over time is so key that you just put words to something that I like sense was just how important relationships are in that and mm -hmm. you know I'm not the police and having that relationship with but I just do you guys have any practical advice for those of us who aren't therapists or clinicians but who may work with people who have experienced um, you know with men who have experienced sexual victimization in some way of just how to support them with what they've been through but also you know uphold boundaries where they're needed mm -hmm. and uphold expectations mm -hmm. well I, I think uh you know one you know there's definitely uh for sexual victimization a lot of you know love my mind but i yeah. think um you know what i think about the kids that I should work with, there's such a violation of boundaries and a lack of trust and mistrust that goes along with those lack of boundaries is that the, the relationship I think is very important. So the boys who I've worked with them never disclosed their uh, emotional sexual exploit and others that were very vocal in the meantime. And I think um, just setting up a structure kit, you know, people need structure, they do need their rules and their regulations, and but it, depending on how that's presented to them, I think it's, it's pretty critical. Um, but I, I just think of a point that I've worked with, that, you know, where there's no structure, no boundaries, and that might be difficult in relationship to they're, they're not really used to that. Uh, but I think the, the boundaries and the structure that I would provide for them in that context was new for them, but that eventually came around and around with that. So, um, I think it's like a, almost like a re-education of a different way of operating in the world with appropriate boundaries, and it doesn't have to be done in a majority of any point. But I think a lot of kids, like that lesson I mean, we really do need the structure and pretty much love, even though there's resistance as well. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I, I think structure is very important, but I, as a woman dealing with, as a young woman dealing with uh, this homeless population, they're going to put you in all sorts of categories. They're going to, you're going, you know, you'll be their sister, their girlfriend, their mother, their usually daughter. <laughs> their daughter, yeah, or their, or their, you know, uh, uh, fantasy, whatever that is. I mean, you have an obligation to be both. I, I, I can't it's, to use these words. It just sounds so platitudey, but you have the obligation to be straight up to be true, to be real. And in that, the difference between nurturing and codependency. Okay, because women can get, I mean, anybody can get hooked. These guys are hooked. They're gonna hook everyone. Just, they wanna find a way that they know the best way to get what they have ever wished for, right? So they'll try to hook, and it's not conscious. I'm not saying this in a manipulative way that's necessarily conscious. And part of what is so important is your own self vigilance and always getting good supervision so that you, no matter whether you're a therapist or you're just in a shelter or you're working, not just, where, 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 whatever your capacity is, to get some supervision so that you can talk about this stuff because it's going to pull. It will pull you. And that's not a bad thing. People always demonize countertransference. It's a great barometer. Well, I think also manipulation is a survival tool for mm -hmm. a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, but I that you suggested. And um, so I don't necessarily look at them as bad people if they're being manipulated. It's like what, what they did to motive to survive yourself. So I'm uh, turning that in a positive, loving way around the character. And uh, I think people, I don't even think a lot of respect, but just thinking. You know, I'm going to add to that, um, if I'm going to comment well, can you say something about um, if we're not an agency that primarily serves survivors of sexual trauma, both was coming. Because, because I think that, I mean, you're, you're right on the one hand, but I think that that reflects um, a, a sort of fragmentation, a fragmentation that our society has of mm -hmm. needs. Um, and we think like, oh, your problem is homelessness. It's like right. you're yeah. in this bucket. And you know, a lot of us who work with people who have experienced multiple addicts experiences, we understand that these things are so interrelated. And so you absolutely are a big front line of sexual trauma. And the fact that that's not built in to maybe the way, and I'm speaking for your agency, I say I don't know, but like the fact that that's not built into your agency doesn't change that path. And I think a lot of us probably have shared experiences of that working in agencies where our like, service model doesn't really reflect complex needs of the client population. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what you were saying about the yeah. supervision, I think it's probably you know, yeah. finding the right ways in which to, to push for those for those um, those services and those those changes in, in model changes in approach to be built into your agency. And I mean some agency change and model change is a really boring thing that's really difficult to push for in a lot of agencies. But I think hopefully I think a lot of us from different agencies are coming to realize that we're actually a lot, with the approaches should be a lot more like than different. Yes. Working with a person who identifies with being homeless as a primary way of entering into the system is not always that different from working with someone who identifies as domestic violence as being the primary factor that brought them in. Um, so I think the fields are moving in the right direction, but um, you know, just don't, uh, kudos to you for expressing that and, and for articulating that need and you know, continue to seek that out because that's really important. You know, a lot of research has shown that actually people who experience child sexual abuse in particular have issues with finances and the homeless or incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I agree. I think we all need to recognize that this is something that's occurring to most people who ask about it. Mm -hmm. I think we're on the boundary thing. I think it's really important is people have a, a desire to infantilize survivors and actually to be the opposite. You just power survivors mm -hmm. and recognize that they have the ability to make choices and decisions. Help them to recognize that and to lay it out. Um, I think we are the best model. I think our relationship with survivors is a large part of the work that we do, but also setting boundaries. Something as simple as ending and starting your sessions on time. Mm -hmm. Things sure. like that are monitoring are important. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mikkel and I, I consulted with Mikkel on a case where I had a man I was working with who actually touched me. And so I had to go in and have a conversation about that. 
And it's a difficult conversation because it's crossing another boundary. It's really shameful. But what I've learned from that conversation is his boundaries were crossed. He was never taught at work. Mm. And if I didn't talk about that, we never would have had that conversation where he's like, what do you mean you have boundaries? Mm. So I think What's it's important that? to have those conversations. I think it's important for us to model boundaries and not to enforce Yeah, good. All right. Uh, you and you, I think, Okay. I just want to say thank you for the presentation. They were very uh, helpful. And I also want to say that, and I know this is not what you're talking about in this forum, but I can remember Peter going back telling a story about uh, boys being called at noontime to a hotel. So I'm, I'm still, what about the buyers? What about them? <laughs> <laughs> How could we done, is there any change from getting to them and you know, uh, exposing them? <laughs> I made a lot of recommendations about the prevention and education working group, which brings together a lot of really good fun and we should talk about prevention and education. That was exactly one of the questions that came up that we're talking about all this prevention and education on the part of people who are at risk of being of experiencing things or being victims. What about the buyers? And one of the people who sort of convened was just basically like <laughs> And, and that, but at least there was honesty in that because I don't, I don't think, I don't think a lot of us really know. I think it's, that, that, I think that's a question that involves culture change. It's a question that involves yeah. really big things. Um, and I think a lot of what we're talking about are different pieces toward that big aim. Um, I think it's, I think that as a society, you know, creating those needs, I think that's a really big question, a really important one. And I, the honest truth is that a lot of us are and trying to answer small pieces of it, and there's not a lot putting them together yet from that angle. I think we all have a lot of room to grow in that area. Thank you. Oh, was that it? Yeah. I guess my question was about, I mean, thank you all. I promise that we told this, but I have I keep thinking about working with men and work with the other men. Later. Like this whole room is full of, um, I'm going to make an assumption, so I apologize. Cisgender women in the fields. How do we begin to ensure that there are more more males a part of the conversation? I think part of what happened in all service models, and then I work in the Department of Public Health, start to keep it at men as well. And then we talk about it being men and men, and I was not surprised that no one talked about that uh, variable limitations around. Based on who you are. Yeah. And support. Should this be allyship to be invited into these conversations? I'm going to do that. I mean, I'll start that again, but I don't think it's that's the top one. I know I've been getting my conversation with a lot of other men, and I think. I think there's, 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 there's all kinds of no, no, no. Uh, male allies and I've spoken pretty openly about this in form in the past. Um, so congratulating them for showing up. Right. Um, I think that's a huge problem and I think that even though it's well-being among us in order to kind of get men in the room, we tend to dumb things down a little bit and make things more accessible. Um, thank you so much for showing up. Very well. Yeah. So, this is a real 
Daumen gefällt die Abteilung als Agency, sondern eine neue Geschichte, ja, und das ist eine Geschichte, die ich eine Ja, ich habe mir immer gefragt, ob ein bisschen Wort ist, wo man die Wurzel da hat, die ich immer noch nicht auch gehört habe, wenn man den Erwartungen da hat, dann ja, wenn man mal ist, dann wird man nicht so gut sein. Und jetzt kam sie hier dann. I would have to make a thing there from the majority of saying, and I think also the tough thing is that in many different spaces like this, I think the automatic system is the perpetrators. The perpetrators. Yeah. Uh, I always think about my dad, you know, Paul Barb, the great crisis center. It's like, hi, this is you doing this job, I'm sure that. He's afraid to call. Mm -hmm. And there has been a misconception for a long time, great crisis center, mm -hmm. because people perceive that we see men as